Well, hello, Rock Valley Bible. Good morning. It is good to be with you. I've been looking forward uh, to this time and being open, being able to open God's Word uh, with you this morning. Uh, but I've also been looking forward to this moment when I get to say thank you, Rock Valley Bible Church. Uh, my role at Leadership Resources International is that of Director for Church Partnership. Uh, and as such, I spend time at and with the churches that have partnered with us to support the work of training pastors uh, internationally all around the world as I adjust this thing. Okay. Um, And this church has been very faithful over the last decade to support the work of uh, movements of God's Word around the world, particularly in the ministry that we have in the Far East and Asia, and particularly through Alan Jin, who I believe was able to send you a greeting a little bit earlier this year. Uh, and he wanted to, see, when he heard I was preaching, he said, hey, make sure to let Rock Valley Bible know, I just express my love and my greeting to them once more. So greetings uh, from Alan Jin. Uh, but I'm privileged to serve with Leadership Resources. If you've been part of this church for a while, you probably know who we are. I hope you do. If you're a little bit newer, uh, just to let you know who we are and what we do. We are a ministry that's in about 60 countries around the world, six continents, and we serve uh, many pastors who are unresourced and would not have the opportunity to receive any kind of formal training in the Bible and in theology and how to read, study, and understand the Bible so that they can preach faithful sermons like you're blessed to hear from this pulpit week in and week out, most pastors around the world do not have access to the kind of training that will enable them to do that. So we go to them, and in a very non-formal, interactive, workshop kind of way, uh, we go, we train them, we come back in six months, and we do it again. And what we're doing is we're training them also to train others. 2 Timothy 2.2 Paul says to Timothy, what you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others. And you you see that sort of generational training in God's Word, and that's what we're about. We train them. They train others. They train another group. We call that multiple generations. And last year, by God's grace, uh, we're just a small ministry. I think we have about 40 staff people. About half of those are engaged in the training around the world. Uh, But because we're training national leaders to train others, uh, we were able to have a part in training about 12,000 pastors and church leaders around the world in 2019. And we are grateful to you as a church because we can't do it without the partnership that we have with local churches. Uh, We are a local church affirming ministry out in the field. We want to reach pastors because they have this position that God has given them to speak God's word, the words of truth that will never fail. And so we thank you for your role in that partnership. Uh, As was mentioned, this morning's message is from uh, the book of Acts. I'm so encouraged that you're uh, beginning prepared uh, for a preaching series in the book of Acts. I'm I'm very, uh, just, I hope in a holy way, envious of of Pastor Steve being able to preach through the book of Acts. I love it. Um, I'm excited to bring a message from chapter 6. So if you haven't already turn to Acts chapter 6. I encourage you to turn in your Bible. And welcome to those who are online as well. I see the image down there. That's what you see uh, when you see me, which is a little bit scary. But uh, what, what a joy that uh, all the craziness of what's going on, we can still be connected with one another in, in the body. And we're praying, uh, <laughs> yeah, we're praying, Lord Jesus, come. And in the meantime, would you, would, you, would you do something about this so that we can all gather again? But even in the midst of that, that we can connect with one another through uh, the use of technology as a joy. So if you're partaking online today, you are a part of this uh, as well. So I encourage you, if you haven't already, turn in your Bible or power on your biblical device and get to Acts chapter 6. And if you haven't done that, as you're doing that, I want to make a confession I suppose church is the right place to make a confession. I certainly hope it is. I have a confession that I am fascinated by church signs. I've always been fascinated by church signs, all kinds of signs, but especially the signs where you have the movable type and you can get your message as a church out to the world. And as I've been observing uh, church signs and the messages they portray over the years, I I found they kind of fall into four basic categories. Category one is the sort of Sergeant Friday, just the facts, ma'am. Worship service, 10 a.m. 
Pastor Jones, potluck on Wednesday, whatever it is, just the facts. A second category is the category I would say is kind of on the preachy side. I drove past a sign a few months ago and it said, be faithful in the little things. I'm like, yeah, that, that's true. I should do that, but gosh, you're not the boss of me. What are you preaching at me for? I told you this was a confession, right? I said that up front. Uh, third category that I've noticed is just straight up scripture. And I always look forward to driving past the Roman Catholic church in my neighborhood in Elgin because it's almost always just scripture and often just a verse from the Psalms. And I'm, I'm always eager to see what's on that sign. But then there's the fourth category of church signs and the messages they portray. You know the ones I'm talking about? They're really cute, really clever messages that are out there on church signs. And, you know, it's almost as if I just imagine church leadership got together and said, you know what, guys, here, here's the deal. If we could just think of something super clever, just, just amazingly like mic drop clever and cute, then people would be screeching their brakes as they saw that sign, and they would be pulling into our church parking lot by the droves. to be Our church would just grow if we could just think of the, of the most clever thing to put on our sign. Things like this. This is from a church sign. Honk if you love Jesus. Text while driving if you want to meet him. That was on a church sign. Or this one. Adam and Eve, the first people not to read the apple terms and conditions. Or this one. This is one I just saw last week in Zealand, Michigan. As, as, as poignant as our times. Jesus cleanses your heart. We disinfect the pews. That's kind of what I thought. That was my reaction to now, I don't know the motivations for sure of why people put really clever things on their church signs. But if, if they are thinking that, if they are thinking, you know what, this is the way we can grow our church, by putting something really clever on our sign and people being impressed by that, if, if that's the motivation, then I would argue that, that, a, that a church like that has its priorities confused. And when a church has its priorities confused, there's a great threat a threat that that church can be and go off mission. And this morning, the story that we're going to look at from the book of Acts is a story from the early days of the church when there was an issue that arose in, the, in those times, in the early days of the church with the apostles that, that threatened the church getting off mission. And I want us to observe how the leadership of the church, how the apostles and how the congregation together addressed that issue and kept the church on mission. And so let's look at Acts chapter 6. And let me ask God's blessing as we do that. God, what we sang is our prayer right now that you would speak, O oh Lord. God, what a privilege it is to serve a God who speaks. God, we'll, well, you are vast, you are wondrous, you are, you, are, you are beyond the galaxies as we sang, you are beyond our understanding, and yet we can know things about you. And we can know the most important things about you your redemptive plan through Jesus. So we pray that you'd reveal more of him today through the speaking of the word and, Lord, through the receiving of it. Would you give us ears to hear and, and, and eyes to see and hearts to understand and wills to respond to your word this morning? We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hear God's word from Acts chapter 6, verses one through seven. Now in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. 
And the twelve summoned the full number of disciples and said, It is not right. It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers and sisters, pick out from among you seven men full of good repute, full of the Spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. These they set before the apostles, and they prayed, and they laid their hands on them. And the word of God continued to increase. And a number of, the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many priests became obedient to the faith. Friends, this is God's holy word, and we thank him for it today. I want to proceed to look at this story in going in three movements. First, I want to take a look and drill down a little bit deeper into the story itself. So first, the story. And then what is the point? What is the main idea of this story? It's, that's one of the basic principles we teach in our workshops. What is the main idea of this story? So the, the story, the main idea, and then what are the implications? What is God calling us to do because of this particular word in Scripture? The story, the point, the implications. First, the story. Now, this story starts out the way a lot of stories do. Once upon a time, long, long ago in a galaxy far, far away. It begins now in these days. Well, in these days, which days? Now, you all have an advantage that you've been reading through uh, the book of Acts, so, so you might be familiar, but sometimes when you come to Scripture, if you haven't been reading in that particular book of Scripture, you've got to sort of act like a, a paratrooper who's uh, just parachuted behind enemy lines. Uh, once you hit the ground, once you get into the text, you've got to kind of look around and, and get a lay of the land, and where are we and what's going on? And in the book of Acts, it's unique among the New Testament books. Uh, it, it's story, right? It's narrative. It's a true story. Uh, like the Gospels before it, there are four stories of Jesus uh, coming, his life, his death, his resurrection, his ascension. But there's only one story of the development of the early church. It's the book of Acts. So it's really unique among uh, the New Testament books of the Bible. It was written by Luke. It's the extension of what he wrote about in the Gospel of Luke. And in Acts, he says, that was what, about Jesus, what Jesus did. And this is in Acts is about what Jesus is continuing to do. And the outline of the book of Acts is really found in uh, chapter 1. Uh, Jesus ascends to heaven, and before he does, he tells them, look, the Holy Spirit is going to be poured out upon this little group of believers, the, the disciples, the, the, now the 11 disciples, right, minus Judas, and the other uh, maybe small D disciples, followers of Jesus. The Holy Spirit is going to be poured out on you all, and you are going to be my witnesses where? First in Jerusalem, chapter 1. Uh, verse 8, and then in Judea and Samaria, and eventually to the ends of the earth. That's, that's the outline of the book of Acts. You can, you can trace that right through the book, that God pours out his Holy Spirit, he establishes uh, the New Testament people of God, and they're first going to be his witnesses. They're going to bring the gospel to Jerusalem, right? Total, almost 100% Jewish area. Uh, the disciples are Jewish. Jesus is Jewish. They're, they're going to be bringing the gospel as the fulfillment of Jesus is the fulfillment of everything in the Old Testament to people who have that background. They have the Old Testament background. They have the Scriptures as they know them in Jerusalem. But then the next ring is Judea and Samaria. Now, still mainly Jewish, but you've got, you've got more of a mixed group. You've got the Samaritans. Uh, they are of a mixed ethnicity. They, they have sort of an aberration of the Old Testament Scripture, and now the, the Gospel is next going to go to them. And then the final ring is to the ends of the earth. The gospel is going to, going to go to, to all creation. And, and that's the, the outline of the book of Acts. Well, as we're in chapter 6, we're still in that first stage. The gospel is being established 
in Jerusalem. The church is being established as the gospel, the good news of Jesus' saving work, his, his death, his resurrection, his ascension to the right hand of God is being proclaimed by the apostles. And in these days, we have both gospel success and the gospel going out. We read about 3,000 people coming to faith in the first couple chapters of the book of Acts. And then we read about five, the church grows to 5,000 men. So then add women and children on that. There, there's, there's great success. There's great expansion of the gospel. The church is growing. But there's also opposition. The disciples have been, the apostles have been arrested a couple times already. First they're warned, stop preaching in the name of Jesus. And then they're threatened. And they're beaten. And so we, we've got opposition to the church from without, and now we have a challenge in this chapter for the church from within. It says in verse 1, Now in these days, when the disciples were, were increasing in number, there's, there's great growth. In these days, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews. A complaint in the church. Shocking, right? Shocking wrong. <laughs> you don't have to spend much time, unfortunately, even in the best of churches, even in the most godly of churches, and there's, there's a complaint. And sometimes the issues are really small, right? Sometimes uh, the issues are not a big deal. I mean, should we have coffee in the sanctuary or not? You know, I, you know, I have been on part of elder teams that have spent a lot of time debating small issues like that, but at the end of the day, they're not big issues. But then there, there are major issues. You know, how do we care for people in the midst of a pandemic? Uh, what does loving our neighbor mean? Uh, what is wisdom? What's, what's true out there and what isn't true during this whole deal? And how should we respond to it as a church? There are issues in the church to deal with, and the leadership of the church here, the apostles, uh, have to deal with a very real issue. There's a complaint by the Hellenistic Jews uh, regarding the Hebrew Jews. And so you've got still a church that is very much ethnically Jewish at this point, right? And, and Hebrew compared to, but there's sort of two different language groups within the church. They're the Hebrew Aramaic speakers. They're native to Jerusalem. But then there are the Hellenist or Greek-speaking believers. Uh, probably they were in Jerusalem at the time of Pentecost, responded in faith to the message that Peter preached. They were joined to the church and they stayed there. And now they're part of, of the one New Testament people of God. Uh, but the Hellenists notice that their, their widows are not being well cared for within the church. And you know that at any time in history, uh, being a widow is a very vulnerable thing. Uh, but 2,000 years ago in the Greco-Roman world, even more so. Uh, if you're a widow, you, don't, you really have no means of supporting yourself. You're, you're at the mercy of your family and here the church community uh, to receive uh, their care and their generosity. And the, the Hellenists note that, you know what? Our widows are not being well cared for. Now that is, that's a real issue, isn't it? I mean, I would say that that's a fairly big deal. That's not whether or not to have coffee in the church sanctuary. Uh, there's church unity is at stake. Uh, the, the reality of whether God's, the people in the congregation of God's people are, are being well cared for is at stake. It's a real issue and, and the apostles are going to address it. But I want you to notice something. They see beyond this issue that there's a greater threat. Look at what they say in verse 2. The 12, okay, so that's Jesus' 12, actually 11 disciples minus uh, Judas plus Matthias from chapter 1. We read, we read about that. They summon the full number of the disciples, the 12 apostles, some of the full number of believers, men and women, together. And they said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Now, what are the apostles getting at here? When they say it's not right for us to give up um, 
preaching the Word of God in order to serve tables? Is, is it because they're thinking, hey, we're apostles. Come on. Spent three years with Jesus. I can't be serving food to little old ladies. I'm an apostle after all, right? It's not that at all. It's not that at all. Look, look, look at how they... What they say is... is um, it's just, uh, it's, a, it's strong language. They say it is not right. Or, or it's, it's unacceptable that we should give up or leave. Literally, it says that we should leave, leave behind the preaching of the Word of God. And, and actually, the preaching part, the, the, where it says um, that word preaching is inserted there. It literally says it is not right that we should leave the Word of God to serve tables. They're not saying serving others is beneath them. They're saying as apostles, what God has called us to do is to serve people by serving them the Word of God. And we can't give that up. This is the thing. This is the thing that God is using to spread the Gospel. We're only in that Jerusalem phase, guys. This Gospel has to go to Judea and Samaria and to the very ends of the earth. And we have to stay on mission. We can't get off mission. This, this threat is, is not just that people aren't going to be cared for in our congregation. This is a very threat to the mission that God has given us that the gospel go to the ends of the earth. And so they don't dismiss the issue. They put a very wise plan together. Did you take note of it here? They say to the congregation, hey, you all choose seven men and look at the qualifications in verse 3 these men should these are wonderful qualifications qualifications that we should be thinking about in in many areas of church leadership these guys should be people of good reputation full of the holy spirit and of wisdom and so they picked seven men uh, we can note by their names, that it appears that they were all Greek speakers, Hellenists. So there's, there's a degree of wisdom in that the guys that they uh, chose to serve the Hellenistic widows spoke the language. They were culturally the same. Uh, sometimes we call these guys the first deacons. That word isn't strictly used here, uh, but it certainly seems to be we're on a trajectory for what we'll see as the church position uh, office of deacon as it develops within the New Testament. And notice also that when the whole congregation, there's, there's wonderful cooperation between the leadership of the church and the congregation as a whole. And it says that, that this plan, uh, it pleased the people. I just lost my place. Where does it say that? Somebody help me out. Five, yes, thank you. And what they said pleased the whole gathering. Now, I don't think what the author Luke is telling us is that it pleased them because oh, this is a really wise plan. Smart plan, wise plan, good job, apostles. I think what pleased the people is that the apostles were staying true to their call that they were going to continue the ministry of the Word and make that their focus. I think that's what pleased the people. And so they, they uh, gathered, commissioned these guys, they prayed over them, they sort of officially laid hands on them, uh, commissioning them, giving them the authority to serve among the church. And you could just, you could just stop at verse 6. And I think you would have a wonderful story in the Bible. You would have a helpful and useful story in the Bible. I mean, we've got wonderful things going on here. We've got leadership taking the lead and showing wisdom and uh, stepping out. And we've got the congregation following leadership and, and affirming that. And we've got people being cared for. And we've got happy congregants, right? They were pleased. So many good things going on in this story. You can learn a lot of lessons from it. But I don't think any of those are the main point of this story. Because we still haven't dealt with verse 7. 
And as you sort of track how this story develops, verse 7 is really, it's the crescendo. It's the, it's the climax of the story. Look at verse 7 again. And this is a summary. This is what the author is saying about uh, his assessment inspired by the Holy Spirit of what happened. And the Word of God continued to increase. And the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Did you notice at the beginning of the story, Luke is telling us about the increasing disciples increasing, the number of believers increasing? That's what's going on. So at the beginning of the story, we've got increasing. And at the end of the story, we've got increasing. That's a little, that's a little hint as you're reading the Bible. You've got a couple, couple bookends there. What is this story about? This, is a, this story is about how God will continue to increase the, His people, to call people to Himself, to, to grow His church through the faithful ministry of His Word. It says the, it, it's really a vivid way that Luke writes this. The Word of God continued to increase. Now you could read that and say the, the Word of God continued to increase. Does that mean that there were more words of God? That God added revelation? He was adding Scripture? No. Luke tells us what he means by the Word of God increased. The Word of God increased and, this is not something different, this is saying what he meant by the Word of God continued to increase. The Word of God increased. Namely, the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. More people are coming to faith in Jesus Christ. More people are being added to the church. In fact, a great many of the priests are becoming obedient to the faith. The priests. The high priest had just hauled in the apostles and threatened them. And if you can read before this in chapter 5, if it weren't for Gamaliel, they probably would have killed them right then. Those, the priests are sort of his posse, Right? And now many of them are becoming obedient to the faith. And what a beautiful way to talk about saving faith. Becoming obedient to the faith in Jesus Christ. You know, what is the first commandment? To love God. You know, have no other gods before me. The first thing God calls a person to do and to obey is to repent and trust in Jesus. They were obedient to the faith. And so what is the point of this passage? I think it's clear that the, the main idea here is that God grows His church when His Word is the priority. God grows His church when His Word is the priority. Friends, this is, this is how God works. You know, this is how God accomplishes His purposes uh, in the world. Think about this. From the very beginning, the first pages of Scripture, how does God create the heavens and the earth? He said, and God spoke, and it was. And God spoke, and it was. God's creative power. God calls Abraham, a word to Abraham. Abraham, he calls him from Ur the Chaldees to follow him. I'm going to make you a great nation. I'm going to bless you in order to be a blessing to others. He, he covenants with humanity through words. He reveals his word to Moses, the law. And then all throughout the Old Testament, the prophets, they're continuing to call people back to faithfulness to God's word by saying, thus says the Lord. Isaiah 55, verses 10 and 11, the prophet Isaiah says this about God's Word. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my Word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return empty or void, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose, and shall succeed in the things for which I sent it. God's Word always accomplishes His redemptive purposes. It's because His Word is the revelation of, of who He is, His character, and His glory. The psalmist in Psalm 138 puts it this way in verse 2, I bow down to your holy temple, 
I give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness, for you have exalted above all things two things, your name and your word. God, you have exalted above all things your name and your word. And the Bible talks about someone's name. It's not just, um, you know, the thing that ends up on their birth certificate or their license. It's an expression of, of their character. God's name is who he is, his very essence. And his word to us reveals who he is. It shows us more of him. And as we continue through Scripture and move into the New Testament, when God wants to speak a final word, When God wants to speak a definitive word, he sends his son, Jesus Christ. John calls him the word. He is the word of God in flesh. And think about Jesus' ministry. His ministry was that of preaching and teaching God's word. He said he came as the fulfillment of Scripture, the fulfillment of God's Word. And then when he ascends into heaven, he commissions his disciples, gives them all authority, tells them to go to the ends of the earth and to make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. God's words. And then we get to this book of Acts. And over and over again, Luke gives us these summary statements that that the the Word of God is almost personified. Here he says it it increases. Uh, Later in chapter 12, he says it increased and it multiplied. We call this in our ministry a movement of God's Word. Uh, we're, We're all about helping to ignite movements of God's Word all around the world. And Paul talks about this when he Uh, sort of defends his ministry among the Ephesian elders. Listen to how Paul describes his ministry. This is from Acts chapter 20, verse 18. You yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time from the first first day I set foot in Asia, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials, that happened to me through the plots of the Jews, and I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable. All of God's words are profitable. I didn't shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable, teaching you in public and from house to house, testifying to both Jews and Greeks of repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And then Paul makes it very clear in the, book, uh, in the book of Romans why he is so passionate about the Word of God. He says, faith comes from hearing and hearing through the Word of Christ. God's Word is his ordained means to save people. And so it needs to be the priority of the church. Paul writes to Timothy, all Scripture is breathed out by God. It's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. I mentioned this earlier. Uh, The Apostle Paul writes to Timothy and says, Be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and what you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others. Why does the Word of God, why must the Word of God be the priority in the church? Because God's Word is the most accurate, most perfect reflection of His character. God's Word is the most accurate, most perfect reflection of His character. And God's Word is the active agent for accomplishing His redemptive purposes through Christ. God reveals Jesus to us through his word. And you know what? If you are a believer this morning, you already knew that. Because at some point, you listened to a message like this. Or you read the Bible yourself. Or someone shared the words of the gospel over a cup of coffee. And God opened your eyes to see the glory of Christ. 
and opened your eyes to see your need from him. And you turn from your sin. You, re, you repented of it and you trusted in Jesus Christ. And God forgave you. He made you a new creation. He gave you a hope and a future. All through the faithful ministry of his word. And if you're here this morning or you're watching this and you're not a believer, maybe you're trying to sort some of this stuff out. This is the way God will save you. This is the means he will use. You will be reading in the Bible. You will hear a sermon. Somebody will speak the words of the gospel to you. And you will realize that Jesus is exactly who he said he was. That he is God's only son. Fully human, taking on your sin. Dying on the cross. And fully God, being raised to new life. Offering you salvation if you would repent. Turn from your sin and look to him for salvation. I pray you would do that. That is the point of this story. God grows his church when his word is the priority. Well, that clearly has implications. I mean, God just doesn't want us to know his word this morning. He wants it to change us. He wants it to transform us. And so we need to respond. The implications of, of this passage help us to answer the question, so what? I think we put that in the kids' bulletin. What is the so what of this passage? Well, first, in a big picture way, if God grows his church when his word is the priority, we ought to have great confidence in God's word. And we ought to make God's word central to the ministry of our church and in our own personal lives. I mean, it ought to be in the driver's seat. Sometimes we talk about this in our seminars. We don't often work with pastors and with church leaders who have just said, I don't, I don't care at all about God's word. I don't care about the Bible. Uh, typically, they care about the Bible. That's not the question. What's, uh, maybe it is the question. It's the first question. <laughs> but if it's been answered, the next question is, is the Bible in the driver's seat in your church and in your ministry? Uh, pastor, as you're preaching a sermon, is the Bible leading, is the Bible setting the agenda for that sermon? Or are your own thoughts and ideas setting the agenda? Is the Bible in the driver's seat? So let's talk about keeping God's Word in the driver's seat. Three, three implications for us this morning. And the first is to keep the Word central in the life and the ministry of your church. Now, I did a little, a little background check. I haven't been to this church before, right? So if you're ever attending a church for the first time, you definitely want to hit the website. Uh, you know, even more if you're going to be preaching there. You know, is there going to be snake handling going on or anything? Okay, there wasn't any snake handling. I checked out the website. Uh, but I did notice you have values and vibes, which I thought was pretty cool to have values and vibes. Value number one, we believe in the power of the Word of God. It says right there. That's wonderful. So the implication is to keep the Word central. You can put it on your website. You can list it in your church values. Keep the word central in the life and ministry of the local church. You know, where we serve in many parts of the world, and I would say especially in places like Africa and Latin America, uh, we have, there, there's, there's not a lack of churches in, in a lot of those places. There are many churches. Unfortunately, many of the pastors of those churches have, um, how should I say it? They have bought into a certain American export called the prosperity gospel. You know what the prosperity gospel is? It's a false gospel uh, that basically says that what God wants from you, you should follow God, you should devote yourself to him. And if you do that, you can expect that you will always be healthy and that you will always be happy and that you will be, always be materially wealthy and that generally always, things will always work out for you. And if they aren't, it's probably because you're not serving God faithfully. And you can imagine that if you are a pastor in a, in a village somewhere who hasn't been trained in how to study the Bible and you're, you're really 
wanting to serve the people in your congregation and you just don't know what to do and you can turn on the TV, really easy access, and you'll have a very, uh, you know, handsome person who is well-spoken in front of you on the TV speaking this prosperity gospel. And you're like, wow, that, that seems to be working for them. Maybe that's what I should be telling my congregation. Now, by God's grace, we, we have pastors who have taken that route coming to our training seminars and it is just a glorious thing to hear a pastor say, you know what? I have been preaching for 15 or 20 years and I've never really preached God's word. I've preached my own ideas. I've preached other things I've heard other people say. But because I'm now learning how to read and study and understand God's Word. I'm just learning the basic principles of biblical interpretation that, that every Christian, that all of us need to know and understand as we read and study our Bibles. And I say, from now on, I'm going to preach God's Word. And so we're seeing pastors transformed. It all begins there. They're the first ones transformed by God's Word. And then as they are transformed, God transforms their churches. Now, I, I seriously doubt that there's a great temptation for this church to go down that, that full-fledged gospel prosperity route. I mean, we can recognize that pretty easily, but there are subtle forms of that in many churches. Uh, a hesitancy to, to talk about suffering. A hesitancy to talk about the hard parts of the gospel. A hesitancy to, 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 to look at the full counsel of God's Word, that we have many temptations in our churches, a temptation to rely on technique or strategy, a, a, tech, a, a temptation to be trendy or, or, or culturally relevant. The question is, what do you want your church to be known for? Do you want to be known as the well-run church? Do you want to be known as the exciting church? Do you want to be known as the relevant church? Do you want to be known as the cool church? Or do you want to be known as the uncool church? Or the little house in the prairie church? Or, or the, um, you know, when calls the heart church? What do you want to be known as, as for as a church? The theologically precise church? Or do you want to be known as a church that is anchored in God's Word? A church that points others to Jesus through His Word. I love how Jonathan Lehman puts it in his book, aptly named The Word-Centered Church. What should it look like? He talks about how words, if, you, if you're going through a canyon and you shout and, and the words will reverberate and sort of bounce off the walls of the canyon. He says, picture it this way. The evangelist or the preacher opens his mouth and utters a word, God's word. But the word doesn't just sound once. It bounces or reverberates. It reverberates through the church's music and prayers. It reverberates through the conversations between elders and members, members and guests, older Christians and younger Christians. The words bounce around the life of the church like a metal ball and a pinball machine. But the reverberation shouldn't stop there. The church building doors should be open and God's words should echo out the doors down the streets, into the members' halls and workplaces, members' homes and workplaces. The reverberations of sound that began in the pulpit should eventually be bouncing off the walls in dining rooms and kitchens and children's bedrooms off gymnasium walls, cubicle dividers, the inside of city bus windows, through emails, text messages, and internet pages. The Word of God. We keep it central as it reverberates from here into our community. Now, just a clarification here. Uh, it's not as though being a word church is saying, hey, we're a word church. Don't worry about acts of service. Don't worry about ministries of compassion. Don't worry about justice. And this isn't an either or. We don't have to choose between word and deed. Making the word primary doesn't, doesn't eliminate ministries of mercy, it clarifies them. Uh, we're seeing this happen in places like Zambia, where we're working with the ministry called CURE. CURE ministers to children who have physical deformities, 
by giving them access uh, to surgery and medical care. And we've been training their staff so that even as they're ministering to the physical needs of these children, they're also speaking the gospel to them. So keep the word of God central in the life and the ministry of the church. Second implication, cultivate a love for God's word. Cultivate your own love for God's word. You know, there's sort of a running joke among um, pastors and preachers that any message, the application of any message can be boiled down to, you know, just tell them to read their Bible and pray more. Any message, just, just tell them to read their Bible and pray more. You know, I, I'm actually pretty good with that. I mean, how bad would it be? All the churches that are gathering or online all around the world this Sunday morning, if, if believers walked away from their church devoted to reading their Bible more, and, and seeing more of Jesus in the Bible. And, and being transformed more and more into his image. And loving their neighbor better. And loving the gospel more. And speaking it more in their neighborhoods and in their homes. Would that be such an awful thing? Psalm 1 says, Blessed is the man or the woman who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor um, sit with the sinners, nor, nor, nor stand with the sinners, nor sit with the mockers, but his or her delight is in the law of God. To delight in God's law. And what is the result? Like a tree planted by the water, flourishing, growing. God giving the growth when his word is the priority. Let me make one suggestion in this. If you're having trouble reading the Bible, read it with somebody. At the beginning of this year, my wife Mickey and I uh, began reading through the Bible together. We're not always sitting next to each other when we're reading it, but we're kind of on the same reading plan. And as you might imagine, she's basically kicking my butt. She's way ahead of me. But it's not about that, even though I make it about that. Um, it's about being able to, to have something to talk about when we're together. And like, hey, did you read that this morning? I'd never thought about that. What did you think about it? So let me encourage you to read the Bible with someone. God will grow you as you not just read his Bible, but as we read from Psalm 119. You know, Psalm 119 that was read earlier, 176 verses not just uh, about God's Word, but about how God changes us through His Word. And then finally, third implication, complement the Word with prayer. There's an E in that, complement. Complement the Word with prayer. Don't forget about prayer. And I'm sort of embarrassed that I waited till this long in the message to mention it, but prayer is incredibly important in this passage. You notice that the apostles in verse 4 say that they're going to devote themselves, first of all, to prayer and the ministry of the Word. Prayer comes first in their listing of it here anyway. We're going to devote ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the Word. It's a recognition here that, on the one hand, reading the Bible is a lot like reading other things. You're trying to find the main point of something. If you're reading a story, the stories in the Bible work like other stories. If you're reading poetry, the poetry in the Bible works like a lot of other poetry in that it has an emotive effect. So we need to read the Bible in a very straightforward way. But we also need to understand that the Bible is unlike any other book. That it's a supernatural book that it was given to us by God the Holy Spirit, that, it, that it's, God's, it's been breathed out by the Holy Spirit uh, through the writer. And that any time we read the Bible, it is a supernatural exercise. I mentioned Psalm 119. Psalm 119 is, is not just a psalm 
that praises God's Word, but it's also a prayer for God's Word to have its transforming effect. Verse 18 says, Open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things in your law. And so as you come to God's Word on a regular basis, just pray a simple prayer. God, open your Word to me and open me to your Word. Every time you come to God's Word, understand that something supernatural can happen. God, open your Word to me and open me to your Word. Friends, God grows His church when His Word is the priority. There's much we don't know in these days. There's much uncertainty. There are a lot of things we don't know in the church, in church world right now. How to proceed. Should we worship this way? Should everybody be present? Should we have our masks on? Should we have our masks off? One thing we do know is when God's Word is in the driver's seat, God will grow us, grow us deeper into him, show us more of Jesus Christ. I want you to bow your heads. As I close in prayer, I just want to read the words of Psalm 138 over you again. The psalmist says, I give thanks, O Lord, with my whole heart, Before the gods, I sing your praise. I bow down to your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted above all things your name and your word. God, we give thanks to you today that you have exalted above all things your name, your, your very character, who you are. You are gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness. And your word that tells us this about you and that shows you how you have demonstrated your love for us definitively through your son, Jesus. We pray this in his name. Amen.